with the topic of efficient programming in TIA portal, uh, my basic uh, my basic agenda for today is to give you an idea of different tools and options that are available in TIA portal, which will help you in different aspects. One, how it can be helping you in saving time in your uh, overall project uh, engineering, overall project development, how time saving can be there in most of the cases. Then how the programming can be made uh, you know, much more efficient in terms of the memory consumption as well. So certain programming methodology, what we might use if we slightly alter it, if we you know, prefer to have a different way, we have options or we have possibilities for optimizing the memory consumption. So that will be another, uh, you know, I mean, uh, byproduct, shall I say. So uh, after going through uh, these tips and tricks, eventually we'll also be discussing certain advanced topics. You know, once you uh, do the program in a such a way that it can be reused, it is standardized at your factory level or at, or at your company level, then reusability of the program becomes much, much more, which means that becomes, I mean, that standardization is always your stepping first step towards digitalization. If you eventually at some point of time would like to digitalize your entire process, standardization is a you know very, very basic requirement for that. So how standardized program which can be reused, uh, you know, such programming, how it can be done. This is also one of the uh, topics that we'll be looking at. Uh, unlike our usual way, I don't have much of presentations uh, today, so I have compiled some certain uh, set of links which I'll be sharing it with you at the end of the presentation, which will mostly we'll be discussing in this session as well. Sorry. OK. So. To begin with. Mm, once you start TI portal, once you open TI portal, you know, most probably this this portal view is the first uh, uh, view that you will be getting. And uh, if you are like me, or or if you would belong to the most majority of the, uh, you know, uh, engineers, automation engineers, uh, portal view is not always the first uh, view that you would like to have. You always either open a project and then go to a project view, and this is where you do things, right? Uh, if it was a live session, I, I could have asked for more uh, live feedback, but I hope you are like me, you know, uh, liking to do the things in the project view. If that is the case, instead of every time coming to TIA portal and switching it to uh, switching it to, you know, a bit uh, portal view and project view all the time. If you like project view, I can show you one step. If you go to options and if you go to settings. In TIA portal. So under general, we have some settings that we can. OK, so there are a lot of settings available here. What I would like to show for this particular option is coming up here. Start view. So by default, the selection is going to be a portal view in 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 most of the cases. But if you wish to have the project view as your default start view, this is a place where you can switch it and uh, uh, you know things will be OK. So this is one of the first tip that I would like to give you. Since we are here, let me also discuss some other uh, uh, configurations or some other setups what might be helpful for you. For example, uh, if you come to hardware configuration and hardware configuration has got an option called as product support information, which by default is deactivated. If you keep it activated, I'll show you what will be the effect. So let me open a project in, in, in my case. I have prepared a sample project just to save time in explaining different uh, topics that we'll be discussing today. So in that. OK, so. If you have this product support information via Internet enabled, then you have the possibility that you can come to your TI portal hardware catalog, maybe in, in the in the network view or in the device view. It doesn't matter. You can come to the hardware catalog. You can uh, take any of the product that you want. You can right click on them and you'll be getting some options uh, which will take you directly 
to the product support side. So if you want to know uh, all the manuals related to this particular product, you select it. It will directly take you to our sub open. Of course, you need to have Internet connectivity in the uh, system, but once you have it enabled, you are directly reaching it here with necessary filters and viewing all the information related to that. In the same way, if I could show you something on the CPU, for example, any one CPU. Right click, I want to see all the FAQs related to that. So this is also an easy way to get the manuals or get some information uh, related to a particular product easily from TI portal itself. So this is possible once you keep the product support information via Internet enabled. Fine TI portal when you use it, uh, you know most of the time you will need a little more of the screen space. So for example, if I open an FC or an FB any any block when you open, it will be better. Oh, if you have a you know a screen with bigger resolution then fine, but otherwise to get little more space available on your block interface or uh, I mean uh, on your view, one of the step what we can do is all the comments that comes up in in along with all the block title or the network, you can temporarily disable this. Of course you can put it, but if you don't want to view it every time you look at a block, then you have the option to disable the network comments by going up here and I hope that is visible for you. OK, so if you look at this, this is what I was uh, discussing about, so I can't uh, zoom into that area, but this icon what is available is nothing but a toggle button just to keep your network comments on or off. But this network comments on or off once you do it on a particular block, but that doesn't mean that every other block what you open will still be following that other blocks will still have the network comments and and everything open or or even if you close and open the TI portal, even then things will be remaining the same. Even for this, if you come back to the settings. If you come to PLC programming ladder FPD. Uh, let me find out. OK, so once you come to PLC programming here, you have the option ladder FBD uh, STL. So you have the option to either make it enabled or disabled. So what I would like to do, I don't want to see the network comments all the time. Whenever it is needed, I will I'll look at it. That's it. I keep it disabled. Now if I open any block by default, network comments and all will be disabled, giving you a little more uh, you know, view space, so to speak. OK. Fine. Among the topics what I would like to discuss, I one of the first uh, topic that I had thought of is getting diagnostics of all these devices, all the modules what you have in the system is almost always useful for any project. So we have some instructions. We have some ways in which people take the diagnostic data. For example, just to show you if I take uh, one IO station. If I go in and add some. So let's say I I'll add a digital output card, for example. So if I go with a standard digital output card, it's a 16 channel digital output card. So once we go to the properties, once we look at the uh, output IO addresses, so two bytes of address it is consuming, which is expected. We know what it is. Now, in this case, if you want to have the diagnostic status or the channel status or the model status of each of this, a couple of ways that you can do this is once you go to the program instructions. If you come to extended instructions under diagnostics, you have the option of module states and device states. So these two instructions, I hope most of you are already using it. I'm not going into the explanation of these two instructions here, but programmatically taking this diagnostic uh, uh, values, you, I hope you are already doing that. What I would like to show you right now is uh, another possibility. If you have the modules, which is at least basic, uh, uh, at least standard or high feature, I hope you know that 
for example, ET200 SP and MP IO systems, different interface module and IO modules available are of different categories, which can be classified either as basic, standard, high feature, etc. So if you have a standard or a high feature card, then what I'm going to say will be available for you. So now, so far, if you have a look, output address, two bytes of output addresses being consumed, which we know what it is. But now, if I go to DQ configuration, there is an option called as value status. This value status, once I enable, okay, before explaining that, now let me go to the IO address area. Just by enabling value, uh, value status, what you see right now is for a digital output card, okay, for a digital output card, it is consuming now not only output memory area, which what we usually expect, but now it is also consuming some input memory area. To be exact, it is consuming two bytes of input memory as well. So what these two bytes of input memory is actually doing for you is nothing but it is giving you the status of individual channels. Now, it depends on the module, of course. If it is a standard type module, then usually the diagnostics is available only at the module level. So if even if any one module gets fault, you know, all your input of that corresponding uh, module will be showing faulty. But if you have a high feature module, which is actually capable of giving you diagnostics even to channel level. So for example, for a high feature card right now, this, this is again an output card consuming only one byte of uh, output memory, one byte because this is an eight channel card right now. But the moment I go to DQ configuration and enable the so-called value status, now if I come here, it is actually consuming one byte of input and one byte of output. Now in this case, so if Q2.0 is your address, that particular channel status, you will be getting it in I2.0 in this case. Same is applicable even for input modules as well. I was just showing it for output modules. So for example, if I take a high feature digital input card. So have a look. This is an eight channel digital input module what I'm taking. If I take it into my configuration, by default, an eight channel digital input module only need one byte of input memory, which is what we see here, byte three. So 3.0 to 3.7. But even for this module, if I come to DI configuration and I enable value status, now if I go back to the IO addresses, you will see even for an eight channel module, now it is consuming two bytes of memory, which is nothing but one byte. The I3.0 to I3.7 in this particular case will be directly your uh, input status. I4.0 to 4.7 in this case will reflect the module, I mean, the channel status of individual modules. So without writing even a single line of code you have the possibility of getting the module status and uh, uh, i mean uh, in fact you'll have the possibility of getting even the diagnostics up to channel level if you have the corresponding card and just by enabling the so-called value status option only one point i would request you to remember in this case that is for this option to be available you need to have the modules both your interface module and the IO modules, what you take, it should at least be standard or high feature. Basic uh, cards will not be having this option. Okay. So that was one first uh, topic that I wanted to show, which is by uh, how to take diagnostics without writing. If, if it was via program, then I hope this uh, device states and module states instruction is already known to you. If not, the help file is pretty self-explanatory. Please have a look. These instructions are also really helpful in getting the status. Okay, so that was one. I'll, I'm, I'm moving into another, another topic, which quite frankly, it is a bit surprising that even uh, sometimes even experienced programmers who are very much used to, uh, you know, DI portal or even even Siemens automation system. Even experienced programs sometimes miss to get the idea behind FC and FB. When we write program within the uh, uh, DI portal or, or or within the Step Seven platform, we have the concept of organization blocks OBs. Then we have FCs functions and function blocks. So when FC will be used, when FB will be used, you know, this is uh, I, I saw sometimes, you know, I mean, uh, as a confusing topic for most of the people. So let me try to give you an explanation on that. 
and again, what I've mostly seen is, you know, always using FB is kind of the uh, safe way to do things, you know, except for some extra memory consumption. There is nothing much you know, wrong that could be happening while using the FB. So I see people tending more towards FB, which is totally OK. But as I said in the beginning, if we reach to a point where we want to optimize the memory consumption, if there is a possibility, then why not? Let us make use of FC itself. But when to make that decision or, or what differences will FC and FB give? Let me give you an idea. I'm not going into the very, very basics. I hope you all know that uh, FC, when you call it, there is no DBs associated with that. But when you call an FB, a function block, always you have to give an instance DB for every block call. OK, keeping that in mind. Let us start one of the uh, first FC. So I have prepared one FC here. All I'm using this for is to, you know, uh, calculate the average of two numbers. So I am taking two integer num I mean, two real numbers as input. I have an output, which is nothing but the average value. And of course, to calculate average, uh, I need to have the sum stored somewhere, which is not my final result. So I make use of the temporary variable in this case. OK. This program, in fact, is is pretty is is always OK. There is no uh, problem. There is nothing wrong with that. The place where people tend to make uh, misconceptions is mostly about the usage of temp memory area. So before giving you a demo, let me first uh, say you some things. So let me tell you something. You can think of using temporary memory area only when you if you are sure that you are writing some value into the temporary memory area and you are consuming it within that scan cycle, within the end of that uh, program execution itself, within the end of execution of that block. If you want to read the temporary memory area without writing anything into it, or if you expect that you know you, you store something now and in the next or the future scan cycle, you would like to access that, temporary is not the way to go ahead. But in this example anyway, when I'm calculating the most complex average, here it is totally fine because all I'm doing is at first I am calculating the sum, writing it into that temporary variable and within that same before the end of this uh, this block execution itself, I am consuming it and giving it as you know, I mean some other result. That's fine. So let's have a look at it. So if I call that uh, FC here. I also have prepared one DB with some uh, random variables now. This DB variable if you want to connect it uh, over here. OK, this is another point. Of course, we can type the values and take the data. So I know that the name of the DB is demo DB. So demo data dot number a one. You can type it like this or you always have the possibility of drag and drop in TI portal. So for dragging and dropping, let me show you some methods. If you use the split screen option and use one of the panes to open up your uh, DB. Yes, this is one way that you can make use of the entire screen and you can easily drag and drop instead of doing the same, uh, you know, typing the entire addresses. Other than this, another possibility would be if you know about uh, under the project tree, there is a so called details view. This details view will give you a peek into the object what is selected in the project tree. So right now if I am selecting my program blocks folder under the blocks folder, what are there? I can have a look here. Similarly, if I open it up, if I open it up and I, if I select that DB inside that DB, all the variables what are there, I can see that here. So this is even applicable for tag tables, for example. So this is another method which you can you know, make use to ease your life in programming and just doing the drag and drop option. OK, done. So uh, a small program, I'm using an FC, doing some uh, small average calculation with the help of utilizing internally a temporary variable. Let me try to download this. I don't have a real controller here with me, so I'll take PLC Sim Advanced for the simulation. OK, I'll start a PLC, maybe PLC A, something. Start.
whenever you want to use PLC SIM advanced, the only one step that you need to do for the project is go to the project properties and uh, make sure simulation is actually enabled. Support simulation during block compilation is enabled, which I have already done in this case. OK, so my things are done. I'll try to download. Loading. I can have a look here how the uh, CPU is actually behaving. You will get to see the LED status as what it is available on the CPU itself. Yes, consistent download, load. And once the loading is complete, I can ask my CPU to start, which will reflect here showing in the LEDs. OK, anyway, I'll minimize that. So my uh, downloading is done. I go to monitor mode. I monitor everything. I come to the DB as well. And even the DB I can monitor. I can modify the variables here or here. Let me do it. It doesn't matter. So if I go to modify operand, I give, uh, I don't know, 11. And the second one, modify 33. I get the average without no problem. So this is the common use of FC and to be more specific, I'm trying to concentrate on the use of temporary uh, memory here. Keeping this basic understanding in mind, let me go ahead and open the second uh, block what I have. Go offline. So the second block what I have here is actually used to calculate the, uh, you know, the, the run hour of a motor, a device, something. So all I have is actually a Boolean input where I'm expecting some pulse per second. I'm calculating that seconds and that second information, I'm using it to finally calculate the total run hour. To do this, my block actually has only uh, one input and one output. So which is if I open the block. So I have my run pulse, which I'll be giving it here and the final run hour. Uh, I've made it as an in out. So that's why it is appearing here. So I give the pulse every second when uh, when the motor or, or when the device is running and I get the run hour calculation here. Let us have a look at the calculation. What is done internally? So whenever the pulse input is coming up, I am incrementing the second. So this second is actually a variable what I have made in the temporary area. So I am incrementing that second one by one. And if the second value, oh, sorry, I forgot to zoom in. OK, if the second goes above 60, I'm incrementing the minute and also I move the value zero to seconds. And similarly, if the minute goes beyond 60, I uh, increment one in the run hour and I move zero to so, I mean, basic calculation is what is being done here. But the most important point I want to show is here the seconds variable and the minutes variable. I am keeping it as my internal temporary memory. And I hope you already see the point here. This first time when I am adding this seconds, so when the first pulse come in, this, OK, by default, the second variable will be having the value zero, of course, so zero plus one, one. And in the second scan cycle, that one what was stored in the previous one is actually expected here. This will not happen. Let me show it to you. So if I go to my uh, this one. I had made some variables for this as well. OK, so I have some. So what I have done machine one run and I have enabled the clock memory in my CPU. So I need a pulse to be given there. So let me give the edge bit over there and I have the run hour of machine one, which I'll calculate like this. That's it. I'm calling it only one time and the uh, program is pretty simple. I'm just doing this. So let me download this. Load. OK, so here monitoring will be a little bit tricky because since I'm taking a positive edge, I might not be able to see that pulse going in. But anyway, let's give a try. 
So if I come and split the screen up, if I monitor this block as well. So what you see here is I'm going to make the run uh, feedback on. So when I make it on, ideally I should have got the second variable incrementing here, but what you see is nothing. This pulse, since it is actually just an edge, which is uh, on only for one scan cycle, you are not able to monitor it exactly, but eventually nothing, no change is happening inside this particular block just because we have made it as a temporary variable. And in a temporary variable, what happens is at the beginning of the execution, you get the temporary variable. When this block FC2, the last network is completed, that temporary variable is removed from the scope of this FC. It goes back to zero, we can consider. This is the scenario where you need to have a local memory for the block what you actually uh, are creating. The first example of the average where you were writing something into that uh, variable and then reading it was totally fine. But now here you are writing and you expect that value to be retained or, or value to be available there even after some uh, certain machine cycles. So in, in such cases, we do not recommend, I mean, we cannot use this uh, so-called FC concept with a temporary memory internally. We have to go with FP. So at least let me show you whether the FP in this case will with the same logic will work or not. Now to show that, OK, I can create a new block here like this. I'll call it uh, okay, some name block, but I'll make it FP. Uh, copying this is a huge task for me. If I open up that FC, I split the screen. I can almost copy everything and I can paste it here, but then all the variables are so uh, copy pasting FC FB is going to be a big task for me. Let me tell you if you feel, uh, you know, oh, why am I doing this? If you feel like that while using TI portal, remember there is definitely some easy option available for you to do that. So this FP what I created, I'm just deleting it. Let me introduce you to the concept of TIA portal add-ins. With TIA portal version 16, if you have noticed, your TIA portal on the right side, you have a folder, I mean, you have a separate tab uh, 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 here as a task card called as add-ins. This is the one what I'm speaking about. So if I go into this add-ins, uh, this is using the concept of TIA portal openness just by writing some code in, um, uh, I don't know, maybe C-sharp or VB or any, any .NET framework you can create an add-in and that add-in you can uh, insert or, or you can um, add it into your TIA portal to leverage its functionality. The three add-ins what you see here are actually available in Siemens site. It is already published. So if you go to, I'll be sharing this link as well. So we have a entry with a lot of downloads available. So this add-in uh, functionality, how the add-in is actually used, where to install it, how to install it, or even if you want to create an add-in, there is even some application example where you can, uh, you get a sample code and you can go ahead and create your own add-in. So all I have done here is, is I have installed some add-ins and one of the add-in available in the support site is, as you see the name here, FCFB converter. Since I have added this add-in and I have enabled it in my TI portal, now what I can do is, so this was my FC, right? FC2. So I just make a copy of that FC for the time being. I paste it. So this FC5, let me name it demo FB. I know it is still an FB. But now all I'm doing is I right click on this. I have my add in section here. Under that, if I go to FCFB converter. Second. I have, the, so since I am right clicking on an FC, I get an option to convert it to FB. So all I do is that. It compiles the block, it converts the block into an FB and here you go. You have that block with the same set of code what you saw before, but right now the only change I want to do is all the variables which we had declared previously inside the FC as temporary. 
Now I want to have them under static. Now that is one difference be between FC and FB. I hope this is again a known fact to you. FB has got a memory area called as static and what static uh, is doing or, or how static is different from temporary memory is just that static will be assigned a specific memory inside the instance DB. So when you come to the main uh, program and when you want to call that FB, so when you call it like this, every time you call an FB, uh, a DB will also be assigned for it, right? So in that DB, if I open that uh, demo DB, what is created, our static variable has got some dedicated memory there. So even if you want to access this in some later scan cycle, this is totally fine. Now this, let me do the same logic up here. Whatever we did before, I'm just converting it into this FB logic and now let me delete this network. So same logic, even internally all the program, everything is same. Only change I did was I've taken the variables from temporary and I've put it in the static only because I want to have access to those values even in later scan cycles. Done. Let me download. If I go to monitor mode. Oh, this was already on, so open and monitor. Now you see here already, see since the machine run feedback is given, my seconds variable is in fact increasing. So some changes happening which we did not saw in the last one. And if I stop this, no, stop to zero. And that's it. So 30 seconds, it is just remaining there. So this is one of the case where an FC will not help you in doing things. You will eventually end up with FB and especially the use of temporary. So if there is a possibility for you to use temporary, please try to go ahead with that because temporary will not consume much of your uh, code work. I mean uh, uh, data work memory, but if you do it uh, in static, which is eventually coming up in in a DB that will consume your uh, data work memory. OK, so that was one of the demo what I wanted to give. Moving ahead, let us go to a next example where FC might not be your uh, right choice. I have an FC here, uh, the third FC. Ah, OK, so this is in fact the same concept as uh, as what you had before. Uh, so this program is all it is doing is it is just having two inputs and one uh, output. I'm just latching that output uh, with the help of this this latch bit. So I'm using an SR block. I know some of you might be thinking, no, I need not do this program like this. I have some easy way to do this. I know this is just for a demo, but if you end up doing something like this, I just wanted to show you the bit what you give on top of the SR block is actually retained there so that you will get the output even in the next scan cycle. Let me show you uh, what I mean by that. So if I call that FB and if I open my DB, I'll take, uh, okay, I'll take say machine one start, machine one stop and uh, machine one conveyor output, I'll give us the contactor. So simple and internally all that is happening is it is just latching, but this latch bit what you see here is, is something that is saved in the temporary bit. So the same topic that, that we discussed just before, but just to give you a demo that even, because this is these are all some cases what I have seen uh, in certain programs, I would say. Open that monitor. Okay. Now here what will happen is if I go ahead and modify this to one. Yes, my set bit is high, so because of that it is latched. So since it is a SR block, what I expect when I take this uh, input off, the output should remain there. But what you see is that the output is also gone because the latch bit is again inside a temporary and the same topic, the same explanation. 
Okay, I'm I'm not going to give you a demo of converting this into an FP anyway. I hope you got the idea. Okay, next one or the last one in this particular uh, scenario. So here, the simple FC, all I have done is I have just one input and one output. If I get the run status, I want to give an indication lamp on, which is pretty simple. Nothing in between, no lamps, nothing has come up in between. But here, all I want to do is I want to introduce a little bit of delay. When the run status come up, I don't want the output to be turned on immediately. I want the output maybe after two seconds. So I have my awesome timers for this. I take the timer. When I call the timer, since timers are also internally basically some FBs, so it will also ask for some DB. So I'll name it uh, timer one. I've given the timer there and I can mention the time. So T hash two seconds. So after two seconds, I expect the output to be on. OK, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Let's call it. So I want to call this FC twice. OK, and internally what I want to do is if the machine one run is there, then I want the machine one indicator to give uh, a status. Similarly, if the machine two run is there, I want the machine two indicator to give me the status. So what will happen in this case? Let's have a look. Download. Load done. I go to monitor mode. I modify this to one. And if I count one, two. So two seconds over, and even then I don't have my output here. So something went wrong. Let me modify it to zero. If I do the same thing here, modify it to one. So one, two. Two seconds done. Even then, even here the output is not coming up. But if I do the uh, thing for both of them. Yeah, then after two seconds, both the outputs are turning. So what is happening here? The only explanation for that is in this particular case internally, the timer that we are using is actually common, which you already saw that, right? So if I open up this guy. For both the block calls, a single timer is actually working there with a static reference to this particular DB, DB3. So eventually in the main block, what is happening is when the first network try to make it on, the second network try to make it off, and the same timer is pretty much confused until and unless both the inputs are on. And that's what was behaving, uh, I mean, that what was causing that behavior, what we saw. So how to overcome this? Of course, FBs can come for rescue in this case. But I also want to show you some other uh, topic here. Instead of creating a timer in this way, I hope you might have noticed this. When I call the timer here, when, when I'm asked to give a, a, a DB for that, I also have got an option here called as parameter instance, which means instead of calling a single or instead of giving a single DB as an instance for multiple calls, I now have the option of giving a timer. I'll be able to pass on some timer along with my block just for the sake of you know keeping that timer different. So let me give some name for it. So delay timer, some name. OK, see it is coming with a hash symbol, which means it is available in the block interface and no Time, no DBs are assigned to this and by default it got reflected here in the in out area of my block interface. OK, fine. I'll just give the time T hash two second done. So is that it done? Let us go back to OB. Now you see that since our block interface has changed the OB, I mean uh, the block calls are showing red. I can update the block call here by right click and do the update block call. I hope this you all know. But let me show you also one other method. If you have multiple block calls in the same uh, block and if you want to update all of them rather than right clicking and doing this one by one, let us do it in centrally. If I go to options, a block call, update all block calls. So you have an option up here. 
So now once I update it here, now I get to see a new uh, in out variable asking for a separate timer. So now here I have already prepared. I mean uh, given one timer before that was timer one. So I'll give timer one. I'll make sure that the second time I don't give the same timer one. I'll pass on a different timer in this case, but how to create a DB for timer. It is pretty simple. You can just click on add new block. You go to data block and a data block global data block is mostly the one that we see. But if we scroll down, we also have the option of IEC timer counter. All those blocks are available here, so I just make a new DB of the type IEC timer. Let me call it timer 2. Done. It got created under the system resources. OK, and now I'll give the timer 2 here. Done. So two times I'm calling and each time instead of giving as a I mean, uh, internally a single reference, I'm now giving I'm passing two separate uh, variables here as the uh, reference. Let me download. Done. OK, now things will be OK if I modify to one, one, two. After two seconds, the first output is on. No problem. And the same for the second modify to one, one, two. And after two seconds, the second one is also on. So when you call uh, any block that requires a DB, I mean, I was showing this with the help of uh, I was showing this with the help of a timer, but this is equally applicable for timers, counters, or any other block that you call from the instruction list, which uh, requires a separate DB, or it is also applicable for any block that you have created that requires a DB, which means any of the FB what you create, this FB for any reason, if I'm calling it up here, that will also need either a single instance or a parameter instance. So if you plan to call this FC multiple times, don't give single instance, then it will not work. But OK. Now. This solution what I just came up with for this particular case of just giving a delay for a timer. This is OK, but it is, you know, I mean, hell of a task for a programmer. Every time I want to call this, I have to create a new DB. I have to make everything here. Uh, this is not the efficient way of doing things and we are not here to discuss an inefficient way of programming, right? So this is where I would like to introduce another possibility inside an FB, which you might have seen it called as multi instance concept. So let us go back to that demo FB what we had. Uh, we'll do a simple, you know, I mean, I'm not creating some new FBs. I'll just add uh, run feedback. If I can type it right. Oh. OK, and in the output section. I'll make a lamp, which is a Boolean. So somewhere down below, I'll be creating one block like this, which I can now make it uh, run feedback given to lamp. Done. Now, if I want to introduce a timer within an FB, when I call any other FB that requires a DB, have a look. You will be getting one new option that you haven't seen inside FC. You know what single instances, you know what parameter instances, but only for FB, you have this option called as multi instance. So if you make use of multi instance, uh, this variable will be created in the static area of this FB so that your FB becomes self-sufficient. Every time you call that block, you need not go ahead and manually separate, create another DB for timer, another DB for counter, nothing required. Your FB is already self-sufficient with the concept of multi-instance. So let us have a look. So timer. Um, OK, delayed timer. I have given the name. It came with the hash, but since I chose the option multi instance, it did not appear under in out. Instead, it came under static. If you had given the option single instance, it would be just another DB natively. I mean, right away created on your uh, blocks folder. If you have given the options parameter instance, it would have appeared under in out just like how you have seen it in the FC example. But since it is an FB and we have the possibility of multi instance, it came inside static. Now, because of this timer, will my block interface change? Absolutely no. So let me give some t hash two second time. 
if I go to my main, let me delete them. I'll call my demo FB here. For that FB, I have to give a DB, I know, which is okay. I'll give one. I am asked to give my run pulse, which as we have done before, let me give it. So uh, run demo data machine one run. And I can M0.5 demo data edge. See, already typing is becoming a, a hell lot of a task even for me. So let me go ahead and do that. The edge run feedback I would like to give from. I don't know. I'll give the same run for the time being and run hour. Uh, give something up here and for the lamp. I'll choose the indicator. And done. so the block interface is not asking for any DB. I mean a, any timer DBs or anything to be given. I can just download my block and the internal timer. What is available will take care of the rest. So if the run is made to zero, the output, the indicator lamp is also off. OK, so as I said, just the point to remember is is that this I was showing you with the help of the timer instructions, but the same is applicable for, uh, you know, I mean other blocks as well. So let's say you have prepared. I mean you have an FB for your motor control and uh, valve control and you want to call that motor block five times. So you can call it inside another FB and every time you call it then that DB what is required you can make it as a multi instance DB. I hope we'll see some examples for that even so with this I would like to conclude the discussion on FCFP. So to summarize the points what we discussed differences between FCFP most of you know FC when you call it there is no need for any DB to be given FB function block when you call it a DB has to be given. But the real uh, you know, purpose behind that DB or the usage of the DB comes with the usage of the temp memory area. Temp memory area is something which is available in both a function and a function block, but you have to be careful while using it. If you are using, always keep this in mind. Write a value into a memory, into a temporary memory and consume it within the same scan cycle, you are good to go. But if you write something uh, in one scan cycle and if you wish to have it in, 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 in some future uh, point of time, then you need to consider FB because that provides the static DB option. That is one. So temporary static, that is one difference. Another point is with, with the help of FB, we have the option of multi instance uh, DBs. So any other block may it be timers or may it be other FB which which requires a DB to be given. You can make it multi instance and the biggest advantage is your block is becoming more and more self sufficient. You need not uh, you know I mean depend on other blocks. You, you need not manually create n number of blocks even if you in uh, even if you wish to reuse the same block in future. So that is the whole idea behind this. OK, I hope that discussion was any bit of helpful for you. Let us go to the uh, next topic here. I don't want these. Let me delete them. I don't want these as well. OK, all up to date. Go offline. Fine. Second topic, a totally different topic that I would like to discuss is regarding addressing. Now, uh, I hope you might have already noticed in this demo or if you have attended any of our previous demo sessions or for that matter, if you have seen any application examples or libraries available from our support site, most of the times you might have seen that. We always use DBs data blocks for storing data. We are not using bit memory uh, for storing data. Bit memory is still available. I totally know. I totally understand. But the recommended way of storing data whenever you want to store data, always use DBs. 
why we are saying that with the uh, uh, you know i mean uh, with the firmware or or, or with the hardware of uh, 1500 and 1200 series plc the data blocks can be optimized by itself you need not do anything on uh, so let me make a uh, data block with the name data so when a data block is created inside the data block when you go ahead and create some variables you can make those variables by knowing you know how many bytes it will consume how to arrange it so that it won't uh, you know uh, waste the memory but now we have the optimized block access which by the way is the default option always available and we always recommend keeping this optimized block access don't uh, remove this no problem in removing but if you keep it optimized you don't have to worry about addresses ti portal if you follow the latest uh, uh, not just something what is released in version 16 from the beginning all these features are available if you follow that uh, uh, facilities available as a programmer you need not worry about address at all you only play with symbols symbolic names are easy to remember easy to access rather than remembering some random address like db14 dot dbw32 instead of going ahead with that you can easily remember addresses and address uh, sorry easily remember symbolic names and that is what we give it to you so keeping the uh, optimized block access you just use the symbolic addressing and symbolic accessing of the variables you totally forget about all the individual address that plays behind that let the compiler take care of allocating memory and the compiler take care of allocating all the required resources for that okay now with that especially people who have used some uh, people who are used to the s7 300 uh, 400 or the classic platform we get a lot of questions with that. So this demo, what I'm going to show you right now is mostly to address those points. So I have a, 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 an FB created here. I mean, it could have been anything, but I'm just creating an FB, not going to run any uh, things in the uh, PLCism advanced, just to show you something. So let's say, we have uh, some individual bits, you know, array of bits or individual uh, Boolean bits data coming from different places. I want to combine it into a single word. One of the very common example I'm pretty sure all of you might have faced is uh, when you want to create some alarm tag for HMI panels. You know that our HMI panel does not take the bit, a single Boolean bit as the alarm uh, trigger bit, right? We have to combine it into an integer, which is actually, you know, 16 bit size and then take it. So that's what I want to show here. So let me make some bits. So bit one Boolean and this, I hope you must be already aware that we can drag and drop just uh, as how you would be doing it in Excel, even inside the DBs, inside the block interface and all. So I have some Boolean bits coming as input and I have an output here, which uh, maybe alarm tag. OK, this alarm tag is actually a word or an integer. Doesn't matter. So it is not a Boolean, it is a word. All I want to do is I want to save the data inside each of these bits into the corresponding bit in that particular alarm tag. Because if you remember the some past programming, what you have done in terms of uh, creating HMI alarms, I hope this must be very familiar to you. So for doing that, uh, you know, people go around with different ways, but I want to show you a simple uh, addressing mode or addressing possibility available here. So let me take this as bit one. And if I just drag and drop this, definitely this will cause an error because this coil instruction can only take a single bit and alarm tag is not a bit. But in TIA portal, it allows, I mean, especially with 1200 and 1500, we have an addressing concept called as slicing. So if you have uh, a symbolic access that you are actually doing, but from a word you want to access a single bit or from a word you want to access a single byte, we have an option called as slicing access. I'll share this uh, uh, you know, I mean, link in the presentation, but let me show it to you what I mean by that. Once you give a word type tag or something like this up here, it will show error, yes, but you just type dot B0 b for bit so once you do that okay what is happening
let me have a look Lord. am i making a mistake okay dot b1 let me try to put it inside static Oh, sorry, sorry. B is for byte. My mistake, my mistake. It should have been X. Dot X zero, if you give it, that is a single bit. So this word, once you have it, my mistake, sorry for confusing you if I did. Okay, this word that you have, individual bits of that word, you can access it by slicing access uh, with the help of these keywords. Now, word completely, that word, if you want to access individual bits, then you make use of, uh, you know the dot x uh, option so bit 2 bit 3 whatever here you come to dot x1 dot x2 it can go up to how much ever size is available here so this is a word which means i can give it up to 15 but now if i try to give it as 16 it will start complaining because you know that's a word and 0 to 15 so totally 16 bits is what it has so this is a possibility. As I have already shown you by mistake, this access is also possible. Via single byte uh, access as well. So let's say for some reason from this uh, word, what you have, I need. Um, B1 byte. Which is a byte and I need the second byte that is maybe b2 byte now if I call that guy here sorry if I call that guy here and if I put a byte here this will cause uh, some data loss because this is a word word we are compressing it into a byte just by doing this and we are actually only moving the last eight bits of that particular 16 bit word but instead if you do b0 which is for byte zero and if you want the second byte you can just do b1 and you will get the second byte out of it so the tag what you define if you look at your block interface it will just appear as a single uh, word type tag itself but that word you are slicing it into different bits bytes so if you have a double word you can slice it into booleans you can slice it into bytes you can slice it into words that is also possible so if you want to slice it into uh, uh, word you will just use the uh, uh, identifier w for that so with the help of this you will be able to uh, easily access individual bits and individual words bytes from the status all these options let me also show you another example or another use case for this right now what i have shown was certain bits i am receiving from the field i am converting it into an, an alarm tag but instead now what i want to show is uh, maybe uh, via modbus or something i'm giving i'm getting some value i'm, I'm getting a 16 bit holding register so maybe holding register it's a 16 bit uh, value you you know that so holding register a word I am getting up here and the place from where I'm getting this holding register one that uh, holding register each bit refers to some individual status. So maybe you are combining the status of uh, eight different valves. So eight valves open and close status. You are combining it into a single word and sending it as holding register one. So now you want to access the individual status. So val one open, which is a Boolean and val one close val two open val two close let me just make four more okay not c2 v2 val three open val three close val four open and val four close so 
This is 16 bit. I'm just uh, trying to show it to you for uh, eight of these bits. Not much. So here now when I uh, take that option, just like before, we have the possibility right now to do this. Not only in the output byte, in the input byte, I can drag and drop that and say dot x0. Okay, dot x0 is val1 open. If only it was, you know, just simple as this, it would have been okay for you. But most of the cases, maybe you want this access acting as an interlock for starting off uh, some pump. So when the valve is open, then you want the pump to be uh, on. So you will then be doing, uh, you know, I mean, some on command. You will be uh, giving some on command to uh, some pump in this case. But tomorrow, when you come and look at this particular program, when you look this holding register percentage x0, you don't understand what that is, right? So we, with the slicing access, we don't have the full efficiency of having the symbolic names. So for that, I want to introduce you to the next topic what we have. This is the concept of at uh, keyword or at uh, overlay. The variables what we have in the block interface, so the, if I make it, uh, this has to be set in IDB for this to work. So the very next variable, if I create, so uh, var or status, you see, this is actually acting as a separate uh, variable with the same type, word, int, bool, whatever it is possible. But once you keep this option, now you have the possibility to just type a t at there. What the a t will do, AT will actually overlay this status on top of that holding register one. So let me make it simple. So I'll call it HR one. I'm sick of seeing that. So this this status tag is right now overlaid on top of that. OK, so to keep things simple, let me delete all the old ones. And here I'll delete the alarm tag as well. OK, so this we can see it from here. So if you uh, look at it, so here we have a dot, but if you see for the status, this place, there is no, uh, you know, I mean, uh, connector available showing that that is not a separate tag. It is just a continuation of the previous tag available. Now, what is the advantage? Advantage is that once we have this, now instead of making it a word, I can now make it as a structure. So I'll make it as a struct. And under struct, I can now um, put it like this v1 open, v2 open. And to make it easy, let me copy these names over there. Copy. And if I paste them up here, so this is actually a 16 bit uh, uh, sized variable. I have already pasted uh, around to open, v2, okay, v1 open. OK, so I've already used eight of them and the last one, maybe I'll 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 keep it uh, uh, for future. Future use, which is just a byte. So eight bits plus a byte, which means totally uh, 16 bits all overlaid on top of that particular uh, word over here. Now, if I come down to my program, if you now want to use it as an interlock for something or if you want to use it in any of your program, you can directly make use of this. OK, this can be given down to your output. Now, this does not mean that your block interface is changed. So up here, when I call this block, uh, OK, see here I am still giving a symbol, a word sized holding user itself internally i am slicing it and on top of that if i want to overlay other structures so that i can still have the possibility of symbolic access i can make use of that that is the use of at keyword at keyword
all the details of this AT keyword usage and all these things are available in another FAQ in our support site. I will also be sharing this with you. You can have a look. So all the uh, you know, I mean, uh, prerequisites for this, how to make use of this, everything is explained up here. And just to show you, if you have a look at this, this FAQ was posted in 2016. So this has been there for a very long time. I'm not sure how many of you were really aware or really using this. Anyway, so that is the use of uh, AT keyword, at keyword, and uh, uh, you know using uh, things in that fashion. Right now, what we did was we had the usage of some structure so we want to group some data for example in this particular case all valve status and a particular byte i wanted to group it together that's why i, I created a structure here right uh, this is totally okay but for some reason if i want to reuse the same structure somewhere else for some other variable or for some other uh, case then I have to go ahead, copy paste one by one, or I have to, you know, I mean, retype and reuse this uh, everywhere else. So instead of doing that, let me show you another concept that is possible here, which is the concept of UDTs, user defined data types. Whenever you have the possibility, whenever you think of grouping some variables into a single unit, so that you use that whole unit as a as a single element, always think of user different data types and UDT, especially if by any chance if you come across a requirement of a struct that simply points to the fact that you can make use of some UDTs in your case. So what is UDT? How to create the UDT? Let me show you. To create a UDT, you just come to the PLC data types, not the PLC tag, come to PLC data types area. And here you have the option of creating user defined data types. You can give it a name. I don't know. I, I'll call it a uh, valve status. And inside that you can define the uh, variables as required. So to keep things easy, let me just copy paste this so that I don't have to type it and waste your time. OK, this user defined data type UDT now I have made something called as valve status. This looks like a DB, right? If you have seen the interface of a DB, this looks much similar, but this is not a DB. This, this, this does not appear as a DB, but because of the creation of this user different data types, now we have the possibility of using it in our you know, block interfaces or inside DB. So for example, usually when you create a variable, maybe some variable, you have data types available. There are system data types like integer or word or real or you no know, date and time. So these are all system different data types available. But if we have our own data types like this, now those guys will also be appearing here now. So if I come down, you can now see here that you have this option called as valve status. So if I open it, this is actually nothing but a struct kind of a struct created, but now you don't have to type it individually one by one. Every time you can make use of this at a single stretch wherever you need it. So I hope you are getting to know where I'm heading to. So previously using that AT uh, overlaying structure, what I did was I overlaid another structure and I manually created the structure for all those things. Now I need not make it a, a struct. I can make it valve status done. So if you have another holy register which would like to use the same concept, you can make use of this again over there. So UDT is another topic that we are starting to discuss now and it has uh, much more features and facilities available along with that. The concept of UDT can in fact be used not only inside uh, your, uh, I don't know, maybe not only inside your DBs, FPs and all, it can even be used natively with your IO memory as well. So to show you that, let me go to. Oh, OK, I have an IO device. OK, do I have a module? It's an eight channel module. OK, let me take a. I'll take a 16 channel digital input module up here.
Okay, this 16 channel digital input module is having the address 5 and 6. So I 5.0 to I 6.7 is consumed by uh, this guy. Oh, by the way, did you see what I just did? If I want to see this area rather than using the scroll bar up, down, left, right, we have this option. If you uh, concentrate your thing over here, there is a small icon that you can use, which will, if you click and hold on it, you will get a preview of your you know, area and you can use it to easily position your uh, uh, screen. So especially when your rack is pretty long and if you have so many things, you know, I've just zoomed in right now. Now if I click on this area, now I can move around and position the view to a particular place whenever it is required. Okay, fine. So I have this uh, input 16 channel input module taking five and six of the input byte. What I'm trying to show you is I am assuming that this 16 channel input module is going to be completely used for all my eight valve status what I have shown you before. So if I go to my PLC tags, if I go to my PLC tag, I'll make a tag table and uh, maybe it was I 5.0. And now instead of valves, instead of making it bool, now I can type valve status. So I 5.0, I 5.1, I 5.2 up to I 5.7 is automatically available for you and you can just you know either use it or keep it for future use. You know, when you think of standardization, you can think of it this way. Maybe you have a, a valve and or a motor for, for one motor associated with one motor, you have around you know six or seven tags. Then instead of using a 16 channel digital input module to combine one motor and some other things, you can standardize it in a way that whenever a motor is there, you will always be using an eight channel module. And along with that eight channel module, then you will be creating a structure like this. If you have your FB that, that we have already seen, you know, your FB input, output, static, all this area can have, uh, you know, I mean, these area can also have that uh, same UDT reused. Even if you have some DBs that you would like to, so maybe if I have some DB, I want to uh, create some temporary variable for mapping. So map valves, I can make use of that UDT inside this as well. So. There are endless possibilities available, but all these takes planning towards standardization. But I'm just showing you the tools what are available to you so that you can take it into a much, much higher level. OK, so that was the use of UDT to just to recap or to summarize certain points what we discussed so far. We saw the concept of slicing access. And with the help of slicing access, we use that dot byte zero or uh, yeah, so uh, bits were accessed with the tag dot x zero, x one, x two. Word can be accessed with w zero, and byte can be accessed with dot b. You know, so with this, multiple higher sized tags can be accessed individually uh, with with some less uh, sizes. Second, what we saw, I mean, one of the limitations what we saw there was, you know, just if you remember that example of holding register giving us values of eight different valves, we never knew uh, holding register dot x0 is val1 or val2. For that, if you want to have a symbolic uh, addressing, you can overlay another tag on top of a tag. So for that, we use the AT construct, AT keyword. So using the AT keyword, we did that. Now, using AT keyword, we saw that we had to use the struct to make you make the full use of it. Using struct was totally OK, but if you want to reuse that same structure somewhere else, just like how you can have it, uh, 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 you know, if that uh, input module can itself be used in this cases. So instead of keeping some struct, I made it as a user defined data type or UDT. Now, if you uh, have opened and seen any of the Siemens libraries, Siemens application example, sample projects available in our support site, you will see a heavy usage of all these options. And they are the recommended ways of doing things. They have even some more, uh, you know, I mean, uh, power that they'll be giving you, which we will see in a moment right now. Okay, so that was some 
bit of demo on different addressing concepts. Let us go to the next one. Handling data. Whenever we have uh, a huge amount of data, uh, or, or, or when we have uh, certain data that we use in the program and we want to have it much more readable, we have certain tips that you know that, that I want to share it with you. To give you an example, I have made here a small FC. This is a you know a unit conversion FC. This is converting pressure in one unit to pressure to other unit. I mean it's a simple example just for the demo. Uh, both input and output are taking some real numbers and output is also giving you some real numbers for this. Internally, once you look at it, what you see there is you have the pressure input multiplied by 14.5038 giving out as the pressure output. So as a programmer, you might be knowing what is the relevance of this particular value here, but for any other person who without having the context when they open and look at it, then for them to make things easy, it is better if you could make use of the so-called constants. Inside a block interface, may it be FC, may it be FP, down there you will have an area called as constant. This constant is nothing but uh, giving a name for a fixed constant value just like this. Advantage, readability. Your code will become much readable so that anyone will understand what is actually happening there. In my case, what what I have is if I remember it right, it is uh, bar to PSI factor. And I'll copy that and that is a real number and as a start value, I'll give that value there. OK, so now in my program, wherever I want to use some constants like this, I can make use of this. No change, you know, still it is a constant. Still it was the same effect as that of before as far as the calculation and, and as far as the memory constraint and, and, and everything goes, but your code is much more readable for you or for some other programmer for anyone. Using the constant available inside a block will provide you access to that constant only within that block. So if I want to use this particular you know, bar to PSI factor somewhere inside OB1 or somewhere inside some other block, I might not be able to use that. But if you want some constants declared globally, you also have provisions for that, which is with the help of tag table. If you come to PLC tag table, any tag table, I'm just opening the default tag table, you will most probably be using this area, right? I mean, the, the, the normal uh, tags, what you create. But here, in addition to the tags tab, and the system constants, we also have an option called as user constants. This user constants provide you the same concept and the same option, just like what we have uh, seen right now, but only difference that instead of giving it a, a you know locally to one block, we have some local access right now. So if I you know define pi, and that is a real number with the value 3.1415, uh, something like this. Now in everywhere in my program, maybe in OB1, um, I can use that constants or inside another uh, block. If I want to use it, I can still make use of that here as well. So user constants. User constants will provide you the uh, uh, possibility to make your code much more readable and much more legible for yourself and, and also for other users, shall I say. OK, now second topic under data handling, what I want to say is when we deal with data, so first of all, constant data, this is the first tip you can make use of the so-called constants, user constant. But other than that, when you have bulk amount of data that you want to use it for some some particular uh, you know logic, then start thinking about array. Array is a very, very powerful and useful tool which can make your life very much easy in lot many different cases. So to show you that, I have prepared another small uh, FB here. This FB is I'm just going to do some motor uh, speed calculation. All I'm doing is I have three uh, uh, you know, motor, so motor run feedback I'll be getting. 
if I'm getting the run feedback, then I'll use that motor uh, speed as the actual speed output. If not, I'll move zero, which means I mean to keep things in context. Let me show this. So M1 run if M1 is running, then M1 speed sensor value. I'll move it to M1. What happened? Is it a different type? Ah, OK, these are also real. OK, I'll move it to M1 actual speed. If not. I'll move zero as the no. So this is the logic, simple logic. So I have a motor. If it is running, the sensor value will be moved as the actual speed if it is not running i'll just move zero as the actual speed so very pretty simple logic but now here if i want to uh, you do it for three it is pretty simple i just copy paste it three times that same network what i wrote here i copy paste it three times now everywhere i have to go and change that m1 to m2 even for that i mean even for that you have some options but if you see here the naming convention what I have used, you know, I'm always following a particular structure. And there is and, and there was a reason behind that since I have followed this. Now I know between network one and network two, the only naming change. What is there is everywhere M1 that is there. It should be changed to M2. Then my second network is ready, right? That is possible since I followed a standard in creating the block interface and the naming. OK, but what is advantage for that? Now that I have it, I have copy pasted the same network twice. So I have for one and two and all. Now over here, I select the network two. On the right side, on the task card, if you come to the task card, here we have the simple find and replace option. So I can now just say find M1 and replace it with M2 everywhere you see it and look downwards. So I say find, yeah, it found one here. Replace, 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 replace. Done. My first network is ready now i'll just say m3 and replace 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 you see having standards in different walks of your engineering development is always helpful but anyway this this is not the easiest way that i want to show you here right now but still this is something that you know good to know now that you have it when you go ahead and call this block so forget that guy if i call this block okay Fine, I can connect some, uh, you know, I mean parameters and it will work fine. No problem. Tomorrow I am doing a different project right now and in my new project instead of three motors, I have now seven motors or or or, or I have 10 motors. Now what do I do? I have my logic ready, right? What is the logic required that is already prepared and 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 it is readily available. All I have to do is I have to scale it a little bit. So how to do that? For that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to show it manually, but you got there. You can copy paste things one by one. You can copy paste here one by one and make things a mess. Instead of doing all those, let me show you a different way. That's where I'll be using array. So I'll delete these two networks. I'll delete these two guys. I'll delete these guys except network one. Let me delete the network two and three. I'll go here. Mm. So run. I'll say run M and speed sensor. I'll name it speed sensor of the motor M and uh, uh, actual speed. Also, I'll make it actual speed of motor. OK, now instead of making it a Boolean, now I'll make a array of Boolean array of bool array of real same here array of real done now if i have uh, you know i mean 10 motors all i uh, all I can, or, or, or if i have five motors i can do zero to four or one to five whatever it is it doesn't matter i just adjust it here i just adjust it here and my block is ready so run M0 speed sensor M0 actual speed 
m0 actual speed m0 same concept now if you are going ahead with copy pasting yeah still fine i copy paste uh, one two i'll show it for two times and here i'll just come to task i'll say i'll f ask for find bracket zero and replace it with square bracket one replace 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 and over here replace it with square bracket two okay so using arrays is is a little bit easy at least the the uh, having this you know interface changing is actually a little bit easy in this case fine okay but now when i look at the block interface what do you see block interface is all is all blown up now i'll go to update block call okay now fine now if i keep my pointer on top of this it will ask me for an array of 0 to 4 of boolean so i come here it is array of 0 to 4 of real which means now if i have a, a data block uh, m data motor data some data block and i'll create um, motor on okay sorry yeah on of motor and array of boolean of uh, what uh, bull and speed sensor of motor and this is real and actual okay instead of 0 to 1 i'll make it 0 to 4 All I can do right now is I can come to the place where this is being called. I can open up uh, this guy. I can connect that array completely over here. I need not even do connecting the variables one by one. I can fully connect it uh, as a single element and it internally takes care of all these options, right? Fine, so this is, you know, I mean, so far, okay, not that great. So far, okay, I would say. But this is not the only reason why I wanted to introduce array to you. With array, I want you to know, okay, let me delete all these networks. So when I write something like this, so maybe um, uh, speed sensor of uh, three moving to speed sensor or actual speed of three. You know, this first network, writing it this way, and if I just for a moment create a new variable, I call it IDX or index, whatever you want to call it, I'll make it an integer for the time being. Now have a look what I'm going to do. If I oh, use a move block, I move the value three to that index variable or IDX variable, and then in the next network, I'll copy that same guy. And instead of M of three, I'll say M of IDX. And even here, M of IDX. This first network and second and third network combined, both are actually same effort or, or let me even put it here. I mean, this is even okay. So this network one and network two are actually having same effect. Now, what's the advantage? If I now want to go to the zeroth motor, I can make the index zero. I can make the index four. I can make the index any number what I want. And this logic what I have here will work automatically. Okay. This knowledge I can really leverage if you could, you know, go a little bit into SCL programming as well. Now I know when I say the term SCL, at least a part of you will be, oh, SCL is, you know, I mean, not my cup of tea. It is too difficult, but let me at least give you some, 
you know basic background i hope this is already known to you that even creating while creating a new block i can add a new block yep. maybe it is an fb and here itself i can make it either go as a uh, scl or stl fbd these languages i can select it for the whole block or i also have the possibility that within a block itself i can have one network uh, uh, i can have one network as ladder in between another network as scl you know this is totally possible the moment i select that scl network you see here your favorites region has changed a bit instruction folder if you start digging deep i mean there will be you know a little bit newer instructions available here but you know things are a little different in this case before i show you the full purpose of you know i mean converting this into an array and using the scl and all let me at least show you how to deal with scl uh, at least for simple examples so let's say i have a switch which is a boolean and i have a lamp which is a boolean if you want to make uh, that lamp on you will just be doing this so switch and lamp right in ladder the same thing if you want to do it in scl the only thing what you do is where you want to save the data that is lamp so lamp you just mention colon equal to and say switch you end every line with a semicolon that's it so this and this is now a again the same if you want to move some uh, you know uh, the other variables for example if i take a, a speed sensor uh, okay speed sensor of m of uh, zero colon equal to actual speed of m of zero this is equal oh, sorry outside this is equivalent to moving that value uh, uh, into one another so all these kind of options are possible but the biggest advantage is once we have the scl uh, code written like this we have the option of using if conditions we have the possibility of using loops we have the possibility of using you know switch case statements those things come into picture uh, now, I mean, I, I don't have the a whole lot of time to uh, teach all the basics of SCL, but let me show what I'll be doing in this case. So the same logic what we wrote before, which was like this. So let me take this out. Uh, the logic what I had written before was like this. So uh, run motor zero and uh, speed sensor of motor zero move it to actual speed of motor zero if not if not maybe i'll copy and paste this out here if not i'll move the value 0, 0.0 to so this same network if i want to convert it into scl it will look like this so i need an if condition to check if this is true or not for that i have the if logic i can i have some of the uh, tools available here in the uh, favorites area or if i go to program control operations here i have so many templates once you know the syntax you can type it by yourself but at least until then if you want you can make use of this you know boilerplate uh, uh, templates or snippets shall i say so when i call a snippet like this from this there is a uh, you know kind of yellowish highlighted area that is a place where you have to change something so i'll just mention run m0 equal to true so if that run m0 equal to true then what do i want to do then i want actual speed of m0 colon equal to uh, speed sensor of motor 0 end it with a semicolon if not what i want to do is i want to make it 0, 0.0 that's it this network and this network is right now exactly the same okay now where am i going with this 
So let me show it to you. Just like we have if conditions, we also have the possibility of loops. So uh, one of the common loop, what, he, what we have something called as a for loop. I'm just taking a for loop out here. The structure of the loop is pretty simple. I have a counter variable. I give a low limit and a high limit. The counter variable will go from the low limit to the high limit. So all I can do is I have that IDX variable which I made before. Let it go from zero to four. Now this loop, once it executes, it will be automatically changing the value of IDX from zero to four. Now, if that is possible, I'll just cut that code from there. Let me paste it inside this guy. OK, and inside wherever I have that zero, I'll just make it IDX now. So IDX and even here I'll make it IDX. OK, so that's it now. Your entire code for controlling or, or, or for calculating the speed of you know, I mean, zero to four up to five motors is, is really ready. You don't have to worry of anything else. You can call this and this same block will equally work fine. So I just update instance and block call done. Now I'm not totally done. I have a couple of more points to say. Now here I have another problem. Now let's say you saw the way I have built this, right? So I have uh, made it now for zero to four and even that DB variable what I made for the mapping, I've made all those for zero to four. Yeah, totally fine. But now what is the uh, use of this? What I want to show you is tomorrow if I want to come and change this to, you know, to, to make it for 10 motors. Now it is compared to before it is still easy. But still I have to go and change that 10 at least uh, six and seven places where all things I think so this I'll make it. So this I'll make it 10 and this I'll make it 10. 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 This is 10 and inside the logic and here this is also have to be 10. Yeah, now it is ready for 10 variables. But every time having to do this is really not the efficient way. Of course, we are not here to discuss all those. And this is where I would like to go back to the last topic what we discussed that is user constants. If I go to the default type table, I have this user constant. I can make use of this inside my code. How? Have a look. So motor count and it is an integer. I say that is having the number 10. OK, once I have that, now I come to my code wherever I have kept that 10 instead of keeping the 10 there. Now I can keep motor constant. Done. So instead of writing 0 to 10, if I type motor count, since the motor count value is 10 right now, that gives me 10 elements up here. I can do the same thing for all of this. Copy. Not only inside the FB, even inside the uh, DB variable when we declare I can do that. I messed it up. And since it is constant, I already told you we can access it anywhere. Motor count done. Now your block is, you know, I mean so much reusable than how it was before. If your code changes for any reason and and if you I mean tomorrow you have a program, you have a project where you are doing it for 
you know, I mean, instead of uh, 10 motors, you want to do it for five motors, 20 motors, 100 motors. It is just a matter of coming here and changing this variable to whatever you want. So I did that single change. You come here, all your variables are already 30. Inside you go here, all your variables are already 30. That. So this is the real power of using array. So I said whenever you want to deal with a large amount of data, it is always better to use array. This was the real reason behind that. Now, of course, I was showing it here by creating all these variables individually by creating that data. Now this I can again make it one step ahead by creating UDTs if required. For example, if I go here, if I make a new UDT and I call it uh, motor UDT. And inside motor UDT, all I have is the run status, which is a Boolean, and I have actual speed sensor, which is a real number. You can have more variables. I'm just limiting it to two. Now, once I have that UDT, then instead of creating different variables like this, now I can say this is M. Uh, TR, say so let's say a motor array of, I can say motor UDT. And even the array of motor UDT, even here, this is motor count. Here you have to make the, I mean, unnecessary changes. So instead of calling it as just a run, it will be MTR dot. MTR of IDX dot run status. And this will be MTR of IDX dot speed sensor. I mean, you can go ahead and uh, make the changes even here. Even this was not uh, required right now. I can have one of them deleted. This is again just uh, motor and array of motor count of bool. That bool now I'll change it to motor unity. So I come to OB1, update block call, okay. And to this guy, I'll just connect. that complete array, same effect, okay? So, uh, so far so good. Now, before we really conclude the sessions, two more small topics I want to discuss here. So far, if you have seen the pattern that I have been showing you, I'm showing you different tools and options with which you can make your blocks reusable so that you can standardize your entire thing. You can make your own library blocks. Whenever a new project comes up, you have the option to, you know, straight away call it, reuse it, and you know, you're done with it. Now, on that aspect, if you think of giving out this particular uh, block to someone, so in one project as a programmer, as a developer, you develop this. Now, tomorrow you want to give this block to someone. What, you know, precaution measure you have to take care. The only measure that you have to take care is that inside this block, everywhere I am accessing that so-called motor count constant. So if the person who is copying this block, I mean, person who is using this block into his project, he did not create a constant named motor count, then yeah, then the entire thing will start failing. You won't be able to, you know, I mean, uh, properly do that. So how to overcome this last point? Let me also have a discussion on that. Inside your, uh, this I believe it's a functionality which got introduced in TIA portal version 15, I guess I may be wrong, but anyway. So any type of array what you create, you can define the sizes. Oh, by the way, I hope you know this. You can define the size zero dot dot, you know, five. This is how people do. I mean, this is okay. If you want to make it, you can make it one dot dot five. That's also okay. Or if you want to keep any other number, you know, I mean, seven fifty eight dot dot nine eighty seven. 
this is also totally fine but when you access it you have to access it in that same way in the same manner if you want to make it you know minus 5 dot dot plus 5 this is also a valid uh, index for any array but anyway i'm not here to discuss that instead of defining a size constantly here because that was the whole reason why you know they have to rely on this so called motor count so that they will take the variable properly and all instead of doing that i can say my array when i am creating this fb my array is of unknown size okay Okay, something is missing up. We'll have a look at it. But nevertheless, if I go here, even I'll make this as unknown size, or rather than putting it under input, maybe I'll put it under in out if that makes any difference. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I have to give it under in out. My mistake. Paste. OK, so all I did was I just put it under in out, but my array size is not defined at all. So what is the catch here? What is the problem here? When I execute this code, I know that I need to know the loop has to run from where to where because the index will be going from that low point to that high point. By any chance, if you mention a index which is not really available here, it will cause problems. So how to define the limits? Because I don't want to keep this motor count variable as a you know constant inside here because then I can't you know uh, with all ease of my mind I can't redistribute this block because I have to tell them you know go ahead and create a constant with the same name with the same type all those things I have to tell them. So this is where we have this possibility no oh, line don't want that so if you come to instructions under yeah under move operations we have an instruction called as lower bound and upper bound this instruction is nothing but an option to help you to find the low limit and upper limit so l bound let me make a integer variable for example and u bound another variable so this l bound and so what does it need okay it need a d int okay fine l bound u bound now for the array this array i'll connect it here this array I'll connect it here and this dimension is nothing but show because I mean uh, while creating array it is possible for us to create even multi-dimensional array you know array of array can be created so we are finding the size of which dimension so I'll just make the dimension one now this gives me a possibility of really 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 reusable block I don't have to worry anything externally here oh, okay I have to change this though so L bound to U bound. Done. This block you need, I mean, as long as you are sure of the logic, what is written here, if you are sure, if you have tested this logic, it works fine, you are 100% sure, then that's it. You close this block, you never have to ever open that again whenever you call it it just takes the size internally depending on what array size you connect it here if you connect here an array of you know 10 variables it will be 10 variables if you make it 30 variables internally it will find the 30 variables that's it so that was you know the the real real uses and advantages of having uh indexing and array concept and even going ahead with SCL how much of you know I mean uh, effort you can really reduce you can have a look with this. OK, fine. Next. So even till now 
all the variables what we created, we were showing, uh, you know, variables that uh, has a particular type. So if I come to an option here, this is a simple example. What I'm just trying to show, uh, not so meaningful example, but anyway, I could only think of this. Uh, what I need here is I have uh, an input value and the output is whenever the limit of that particular range is reached, I want the output should be, uh, you know, I mean, uh, high. And what do I mean by the limit? Let me go to the help uh, for a second of TI portal. If it is an integer uh, that I'm connecting, uh, programming a PLC, I hope you know data types. If you come to just, you know, to keep simple, let me take integer data type. Let's say integer. If I am connecting an integer variable there, I know integer variable can go from minus 32768 to plus 32767. So when my value is reaching approximately around 90% of that, so 32767 into 0.9. So when I when my value is reaching around 29,490, I want a warning to be uh, raised. This is my requirement. Pretty simple, but the only problem is if I am making such a block, I have to make the block different different block for different different data type. If I am using integer integer, I have to play with this limit. If I am using signed integer, I mean short integer, this is the limit. If I am playing with unsigned short integer, this is the limit. Everywhere I have different limits to play with. So how do I deal with that? So all I want to do is just this. So if I value Okay, sorry, greater than if my value is greater than now to to define those limits, you know, I know these are the constant values I have calculated, you know, uh, just for the example, 90% of all those and I have saved it as constants. So if my value is so in this case, this is an integer. So I should be giving here int warning limit. So that's how my logic is int one limit then I want my limit reached this output to be turned on. This is what I need. But what is the problem? Tomorrow if I come and connect a, 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 a you know, a unsigned integer or a real number or a double integer, my entire limit and all the range will go haywire. So how to overcome this? Now for that, I want to introduce the last topic that we'll be discussing for today. That is variant. So far we have seen the system data types. We have seen different data types that we have created in the same way we can make it, you know, variant, which means there is no data type I'm, I'm, I'm giving for that. When you are playing with variant, you almost will have to do the code in SCL because in SCL you have some instructions which will be helpful for you in this case. So what I want to find out here first is this value, which is a variant, uh, let me show you this. If I go to my OB, delete all the previous ones. If I call this guy, which I have made variant, if I keep my mouse pointer here, it says I am getting an output that is a Boolean because I know internally that is a Boolean. But once it is variant, what do I see? If I keep my mouse pointer here, it can be any of these. This is almost the entire list of data types supported by the uh, this particular PAPLC. It can be Boolean, character, integer, signed, unsigned, anything it can be. So I'm making my block, you know, uh, independent of the data type, even what I have. But how will I manage this then? For that, I have to use some, uh, you know, uh, built in instructions. For example, I have this instruction called as type of type of you give that uh, element. So type of value. This instruction, when you call it, it will return what type of, I mean, what is the data type of the variable what you have given here? This will return that. What is the advantage? Now I can put it inside an if condition. For example, if type of value equal to int, then then okay my uh, okay then i'll say if uh, value greater than int one limit then my 
limit reached equal to true. I know this is not a real world example, so please bear with me for being a little lame on this. And if I'm here instead of ending, I'll say else if. So now I will copy paste the same stuff else if copy paste. Okay, I know this looks a bit weird, but let me show you what is happening in here. Just to give some spaces, I'm not going to run this anyway. So if this is int or if this is uh, u int, and if this is s int, then instead of int one limit, I'll take u int one limit, and this is s int one limit these three uh, limit va variables not variable they are constant so different constants i wanted to use i have defined them here or you or you can give the constant value here it doesn't matter all i'm doing right now is i can connect any type of input to my uh, you know this particular pin depending on the data type my block will automatically consider what uh, you know limit it has to take and correspondingly it will give the actual output over here so that is the concept of variant and with variant when you do the programming, you know, all these are the possibility. I'm just barely touching the, you know, I mean, the surface on this. We have, uh, you know, uh, more instructions even uh, available here in SCL if you are interested. So uh, ease array. So if a element what is connected, is it an array or not? We can check it. This will return true or false if the, if the element is array or not, or if the element uh, type of element. If it is an array, then we don't want the type. We want the type of an element within that. So type of element, what what it should be. We have this. And if you want to uh, move the variant from one place to another, we can't use a normal move block. We have instructions called uh, set variant, was it? Or put variant. Oh no, variant. Okay, variant set. OK, variant put and variant get instructions we will use to this is equivalent to move block. But when we play with variant, when we are dealing with an unknown uh, uh, entity type, but moving it to a known entity type, we can make use of. So I'm just giving you some glimpse of other instructions what are available, which you can make use of if you move ahead with uh, the concept of variant again. So uh, I'm uh, almost reaching time, not almost, I have already reached the time. So I'm stopping my demonstration here with DI portal. Just to quickly summarize whatever things we have seen, we saw the differences between FC and FB. What is FC, what is FB, what is static, when to use static, when to use multi-instance, what is the purpose of temporary, how temporary behaves within the block call, all those things we have seen. Now. We said as per the recommendation, it is always better to use symbolic addressing because the hardware platform itself is really optimized to handle that. We still have that uh, old type of addressing still available, but know this that is just kept or, or that is still available for you know backward compatibility purpose. So if you have a new project, try your level best to stick with symbolic addressing. And if you are doing symbolic addressing, we discuss that slicing concept. We discuss the uh, AT overlay uh, structure. We uh, also mentioned if you are dealing with a structure, you know, then why not use UDTs? Much better. So we saw UDTs. UDTs could have been used in uh, your uh, input area, your output area, your DBs, your block interfaces. Everywhere you can use UDTs. Handling data, multiple uh, constant values. Uh, if you are using in your project to make it a little more readable and legible, you can think of constants. Constants can be available within a block interface, or constants can be defined in your uh, uh, tag table also. 
and of course when dealing with bulk data which is you know i would say the kind of the highlight topic for today if you're dealing with bulk data think of array why array array gives you the possibility of indexing and with indexing if you could switch to uh, scl then you can go to even have options like this where you can have a block which will calculate the array size in runtime when you connect it and you can you know make a library block for your company forget about it and everything will be standard finally uh, just like uh, playing with array of unknown size if you want to play with a data of unknown type we have the possibility of variant i was just showing a small example on variant as well all these topics whatever we discussed today so far we have been saying that you know standardizing things will be helping you in digitalization because of course, I mean, having standards is much necessary. So what do I mean by that? I'm not going into a detailed explanation of those things, but at least assuming that you have followed, uh, I mean, you had some plan, you, you, you did some standards, you have developed some block following the standards for your company, and you have this, you can really reuse it easily. If you have reached that level, then what is possible? Have a look. I hope you might be knowing that we have the concept of uh, uh, openness. If you have installed yourself TIA portal anytime, then you, you would have seen that there is a checkbox available asking you if you want to install openness or not. So let me close everything else. Okay, so using that openness, I mean, openness basically provides you uh, an API. It's a DLL file that is available for you with which you can write your own program which will interact with TIA portal in a way you know things are done. Now, how you leverage that DLL, how you write the program is up to us in our support site. Oh, I should I closed it? Okay, I think I have it here. Okay, this link also I have included in my presentation. This is a, a, a landing page where uh, a topic page where almost all the information related to openness is actually made available. You have previous, I mean, during the demo, I have shown you the add-ins, the IA portal add-ins. Even the add-ins are developed utilizing that uh, so-called openness functionality. So openness gives you much, much possibilities for digitalizing your entire, you know, I mean, project development workflow. What I have done here, let me say, so, I have an Excel sheet, so you know, assuming that this is your case, I want to generate a, a project for some machines, but I am assuming that you know, if I have a machine, what type of modules I'll be using and what kind of program will be using and reusable type program and all I have already prepared, I have made it ready. If that is the case, then have a look. I uh, on my desktop. Oh, okay, there is a projects folder which is empty. Let me copy that project location. So I am telling this Excel sheet to create a project. I want to give the name project uh, one. That's fine. And I want to save it under this location. Uh, within that, I'll be adding a PLC and the PLC name I want maybe uh, main uh, PLC. I want to have uh, this block created for maybe two machines and machine one name is M1, machine two name is M2. And for every machine, I'll be creating a separate, uh, you know, remote IO panel or not. I'll just keep it yes for the time being. So I just, you know, made some sample configuration like this. Have a look. My TIA portal is not open right now. Utilizing that, uh, that DLL, utilizing that openness functionality, we have we can develop some things like this you know this is just a you know excel add-in what is just created i gave some details here and this add-in is programmed to look into these details and the moment i click this okay now my hands are off the my mouse i'm not clicking or i'm not touching anything it is accessing that uh, dll that DLL is opening TIA portal. It will be creating projects. Oh, and by the way, I'm I'm not the <laughs> the best computer programmer, so 
my program is actually working very, very slow. Bear with that, please. Anyway, so if you see, it has already created a project. You can see on the title bar, it is saved in the desktop projects PROJ1 folder. It has uh, made it. Right now, the project tree is empty. No devices are added. Not doing anything. OK, so now I have a PLC with the name, the same name, main PLC, what I gave there. It created two RIOs. It added one RIO. It added some modules. Saved. Done. My project is I have uh, made this demo just with, uh, uh, with the with 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 adding the hardware. But mind you, if you had made the libraries of the blocks, then it is just a matter of accessing libraries and adding those blocks also into your program. But now anyway, just by giving a configuration like this, your project is ready. I don't want to save this, but your project is already ready. If I come to my, oh, sorry, not this. If I come to that desktop, you have that project folder here. Not only this, just to show you maybe a slightly different option. I can even give some additional uh, triggers or maybe I'll make give the name project two. same. I'll call it, uh, you know, PLC one and this time I have two machines. I want it to be, I don't know, maybe uh, MAC one or I want it to be packing and I want this to be uh, loading. These are the names of the machines. I don't want separate uh, RIOs for each machine, some configuration, just some sample. I go here, but now I'll also do this. OK, I'll just say, you know, run in the background and eventually just give me an archive file, not just the TI portal project. Just give me an archive file. If I click on the create the status message, you can see on the column F. It is doing all those things, but only difference is right now you don't see a project. Uh, I mean, uh, the TI portal window opening up and doing all those things right now. Give it a moment. OK, so internally it had created the project by now. Controller is added, IORX added, device networked, done, done. OK, done. So it says, you know, project is saved and archived. Let's have a look. Don't save this. If I refresh my folder. Ah, OK, it was under the webinar folder, so I think I made I kept the default name. So under webinar folder. There is a project too, and there is an archive file that is automatically created. Now this archive file, you can use it just as how you would do the normal archive, but I also kept that project. So if I just open the project, what I just created. OK, so if I go to device and networks view. First of all, what you see right now, I only have one RIO. I don't have two RIOs because the configuration was done that way. I have kept the default name PLC one and all, so it is appearing like that. Only one remote IO panel, and if I open this inside, I have more number of modules. So I have the modules DI1, DI2, and DQ1 for the packing and for the loading. So. This is just to show you the, you know, the in the hindsight uh, with the help of standardization, with the help of uh, all this um, 
you know reusable code and all this concepts what we discussed once you make your things ready there are even much much more tools available along with the AI portal in the background that you can utilize by your own and so many application examples and library functions available in the support side which can help you in taking your project and the project development life cycle much faster.